Good morning and welcome to the 2023 City Building Summit, Build Up Ottawa. It is so nice to see all of you here this morning. It is now my distinct pleasure to invite His Worship Mayor Mark Sutcliffe to bring greetings from the city. Please offer a warm welcome to Mayor Sutcliffe. Thank you, Suling. Bonjour tout le monde. C'est vraiment un plaisir d'être ici avec vous ce matin. Et au nom de la ville d'Ottawa et de mes collègues du conseil municipal, je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Um, and uh, I'm really, I got to tell you, I'm really excited about this event. Uh, and I love the name of it, Build Up Ottawa. Who's ready to build up Ottawa this morning? And, you know, I, I'm going to focus on each of those words individually. Uh, so first of all, the word build. You know, we have a unique opportunity right now as a community to build a better future for our children and our grandchildren, to build a better city for everyone. I also like the, word, the use of the word up. Uh, it's been a difficult three years, as Su Ling said. It's been a challenging time for our city in particular. Uh, but I think we need to be very glass half full about things, we need to be optimistic. I'm an optimist by nature. So I, I like the idea of building up. And, and let's talk about Ottawa today because I think we have a lot of challenges as a community and Su Ling spoke about many of them. Um, but you know, I gotta say our challenges are not that unique or unusual. They're the same challenges that are faced by many other communities and I know you know, we talk about issues here in Ottawa and we're focused on things that we're noticing. We, we see homelessness as a big challenge, affordable housing as, is a big challenge, supportive housing. Many other communities are going through that as well. And I hear from mayors and councillors in other cities all the time about the challenges that they're facing. So these are significant challenges, but we shouldn't be feeling self-conscious about them. We should be feeling like we have an opportunity to solve them if we work together. Uh, even issues like our light rail system, which I hear about a lot in my new job. No question about that. Uh, but I got a message from the regional chair, the head of government in Kitchener-Waterloo, and they've had all kinds of issues with their light rail system in the past couple of months. And places like Calgary and Edmonton and Toronto and Montreal, they have issues with their transit as well. So we are not alone. We have challenges, but I don't think our challenges are unique, and if we work together, we can solve them. But I'll tell you what is unique is our opportunity. Our opportunity as the city of Ottawa is unique. There is no other city that has the beauty of our city. There is no other city that has the safety and stability of Ottawa. And especially, there is no other city that has our people, our talent, our leadership, the great people like you who are committed to building up Ottawa. So I see this as a huge opportunity and a unique opportunity. Nobody has the opportunity that Ottawa has to have a great future. So it's events like these that get me excited because we can talk about what that future will look like and we can talk about how we're gonna to work together to get it done. So I'm very excited to see so many colleagues from Ottawa City Council who are here today. Welcome to all of you. Uh, it's great to work with you every day on building a better future for Ottawa. I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge City of Ottawa staff who are here today. Um, there is a great team at the City of Ottawa. People always ask me, uh, uh, there's, there's two or three questions uh, people ask me because I have this new job, right? So I go around and, and people say, uh, what's the biggest thing that surprised you? Or, you know, what's different from what you expected? And there haven't been a whole lot of big surprises, but I'll tell you what's had the greatest impression on me is the incredibly talented team at the City of Ottawa. So there are people who go to work every single day to try to make our city better for everyone. The people who work at the City of Ottawa are dedicated, they are committed, they are loyal, they are compassionate, they are hardworking, and they are here to serve everybody in our city. And I am deeply proud of them, and I'm proud to represent them. So if you are a City of Ottawa employee, would you please stand up now? I'd love to acknowledge all of the City of Ottawa employees who are here today. You're all sitting together, that's, that's nice. 
Um, you know, I'm going to mention, as I said, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature. So, um, you know, over the last couple of months, I've uh, met with seven different groups that are interested in buying the Ottawa Senators. And I mention that not just to remind you that I've met Ryan Reynolds, um, but also to point out that there are seven different groups that are interested in buying the Ottawa Senators, that are interested in investing in our city, that see this as a place of huge opportunity. They want to build here. They want to win the Stanley Cup here. They want to invest in our community. So when we're inside our city, we sometimes are dealing with all the challenges. We're, we're feeling frustrated. We're looking at all the things that are not going right. But people outside our city who are looking in see enormous opportunity. They see great potential. And there are some very successful business people from throughout North America who want to buy our hockey team and invest in our community. And they want to build a new arena and build things around that arena. They want to invest in our downtown. So of course there are challenges with downtown Ottawa because not as many people are coming downtown every day to work. But there are people who want to invest in our downtown and see a great future here and see this as a place of extraordinary opportunity. So I'm very excited. Yes, thank you. Alors cet événement est exactement ce dont Ottawa a besoin en ce moment. I'm very excited about the discussions that you're going to have today about the downtown core, about attracting more tourists, about boosting the local economy. Again, I always say, you know, we have many priorities as a city, uh, but it, it is never a choice between economic development and other priorities because economic development is what drives all of those other priorities. Economic development is what supports and pays for all of those other priorities. If we want to fix homelessness once and for all, if we want to build a safer community, if we want to build a stronger city for everyone, we have to drive economic development because that is how we will generate the resources to achieve all of those goals. So this summit is an extraordinary opportunity to build and maintain a solid fiscal foundation to invest in programs and services for residents so we have the resources to face future challenges, so we have the resources to help the most vulnerable, so we can create jobs, we can increase our re incomes, we can improve our standard of living and our quality of life, you know, which are already the envy of North America, frankly. Alors, poursuivons ce travail de collaboration afin de construire une ville meilleure pour tous, une ville sûre, fiable et abordable. We need to build a city that can manage sustainable growth, a city that imagines a better future and works hard to achieve it, a city that cares. And I know this is a city that cares. It's a city that volunteers. It's a city that invests in itself. There are so many people like you who put not just your, your energy, but your time into building a better city, into building a better community, into supporting the most vulnerable. And I think we should all be grateful for the fact that Ottawa is a city that cares. So I know everybody's eager to get to work. I hope you have a great session today. I'm looking forward to hearing everything that comes out of today. There's so much potential for our city right now. And I want to thank you all on behalf of the city of Ottawa. I want to thank you on behalf of the people of Ottawa for your commitment to our future. So let's work together. Let's truly work together. Travaillons ensemble. And let's build up Ottawa. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Mayor Sutcliffe. Um, I'm not sure what qualifies you to be a politician, though, because I'm not sure that anybody's ever actually finished when they said they were going to. So we are now currently right on time. I appreciate your remarks very much. Um, your leadership and your support for our business community and our community as a whole. It's, a, it's really an honor to work with you. Thank you. Um, so, Canadian downtowns, as Mark said, are all being challenged uh, by the shift that we're seeing. They are highly strategic economic areas. In 2018, Canada's metropolitan areas accounted for more than 60% of our national GDP and more than 82% of our population. 
The pandemic has significantly changed these downtowns. The sudden and prolonged absence of employees, visitors, and students has resulted in a dr drastic drop in traffic for merchants. And despite the positive impact of the progressive return to office, school, and travel, the growing trends in remote work and online commerce have caused a paradigm shift. Our first session today, Revitalizing Downtown, invites national leaders to share their perspective on downtowns in Canada's largest metropolitan areas and where possible to help us garner insights about the Ottawa context. Ottawa is unique as the nation's capital and because of our large public sector footprint. Now is the time to transform our downtown to create a vibrant and diverse Ottawa. To have this conversation, please help me welcome to the stage Stephen Willis, Senior Principal, Discipline Leader, Urban Planning for Stantec, Stefan Deary, President and CEO of Canada Lands Company, and welcoming you back to Ottawa, Mary Rowe, President and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. Please welcome our guests. Are we on? Yes? Okay. Good morning. Well, thank you all three for being here, um, some from Ottawa, some from afar. Um, Stefan, I might start with you, actually, and welcome. And uh, I wondered if you could just share with us the work that you do, um, the work of your organization, and how you interact with cities. Keep talking. It's going to finish. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Sulin. Uh, happy to be here. And probably I s this start with me because I'm the only one that doesn't have a slide deck to present. So uh, I'll talk a little bit. And I'm not sure in which function I'm invited. So I'll talk a little bit about the job I had 13 days ago. I was uh, Assistant Deputy Minister for Real Property Services at Public Services and Procurement Canada. So responsible for a portfolio of 6.9 million square meter across the country of office space. Six million of that was office space. And you know what happened to office space during the pandemic? Half of the portfolio is lease, half of the portfolio is owned. And half of the portfolio of that 6 million, 6.4 million square meter is in the national capital region. Um, so three point some million of that office space in the national capital region. So we were managing, I was managing that portfolio with all the project that it entail. And some of you may be more interested as we're talking about Ottawa, the city of Ottawa. Some of the project are, are underway that PSPC Real Property Services is delivering. The West Memorial Building Rehabilitation, which will host the Supreme Court while the Supreme Court will undergo uh, recapitalization. Lester B. Pearson Building that we're recapitalizing. The 875 Aaron Road that was at uh, RFI, uh, not R RFQ, sorry, not too long ago. Uh, so these are some of the projects that the Government of Canada, through his real property arm, real property services, is delivering in the uh, national capital region. So that was my work as Assistant Deputy Minister. Now, uh, 13 days ago, so, and for, forgive me if I don't know every single thing about the corporation, I was appointed C President and CEO of Canada Land Comp Lands Company. So Canada Lands Company is a arms land self-financing ground corporation that buys property that are surplus to the government of Canada, uh, property that they don't need anymore, Rockcliffe uh, base, military base, as an example, uh, Downsview uh, in Toronto. And from coast to coast, we buy surplus property from the government of Canada and redevelopment into vibrant community. So we work with every city across Canada where we own property in order to uh, rehabilitate them, bring them back into vibrant community. A lot of consultation that we do with uh, the community to ensure that 
the social acceptability of what we want to do, but also that we promote and we uh, advance government priorities such as greening, accessibility, uh, you know, social housing, indigenous reconciliation. So all of our project are, are uh, you know, embedded in all of our project are these component to advance government priority. In Ottawa, as an example, uh, we are working on project 299 Carling is one of our project. River Ridge, did I get that right, uh, Tara? River Ridge uh, is the old uh, Rockcliffe base that uh, we are rebuilding right now, developing. Uh, we're also working uh, on master planning for Tunney's Pasture, where we, we're working with Public Services and Procurement Canada, my old department, uh, working with them to uh, re, you know, recapitalize some of the building, but also to redevelop and uh, the area and also working at 1500, uh, not 1500, but the whole Confederation Heights redevelopment project where we're doing consultation with the municipality, consultation with the community to see how we can redevelop that side into again, a, a place where people can work, live and play into a vibrant community. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, we appreciate all the work that you did at RPS, but uh, we really appreciate you joining us here today as you embark on this new role and, uh, and your concept of consulting with the communities that you're in. Thank you for being here. Stephen Willis, what is it you do at Stantec? <laughs> So my new role is uh, I'm the discipline lead for urban planning in the Canadian practice of the company. So we're a global consulting firm and we do work in community development, which is my world, uh, transportation, water, environment, mining and energy buildings, a whole sector of things. And the nice thing is most of you know me from my old jobs and I spent a good decade looking at Ottawa through a microscope working with you and others in the room uh, on many of the issues here. But now I get to look at Canada through a panoramic lens which is my job is looking at what's going on around the country. So I'm going to show a few slides to set the tone for where Ottawa stands with what's going on in North America. And I'm riffing off a little bit of some of the mayor's comments about how we're doing. Some of those slides are not easy to look at in those numbers, but in compared to where we stand in our class of cities, um, we have work to do for sure, and Mary's going to talk more about that as well. But um, I want to show you where we stand. So I'm going to switch to the podium. Is this, this microphone working? Are you able to, now I, I can get the feedback now. So first of all, um, there is a new reality. Uh, if you talk to both employees and employers, people are not returning to the office five days a week uh, as they did before. That, that world has come and gone, and it's changed, and there may be some employers where that's true, but for the vast majority of employers, and this is data from uh, Price, uh, PwC, uh, that both sides see a very changed world of a hybrid work environment. This is the sooner we embrace this reality and move on from this point and redefine what the hybrid world is, the easier it will be to come up with strategies for, the, for our cities of the future. So, uh, in terms of this, this is a, a slide that talks about the, 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 the expect, what people's expectations are in terms of the return to work and the implications of in downtowns. And this is from the City Center Development Corporation of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia is roughly in a comparable size range as Ottawa. That's why I brought that as an example. I think it's pretty indicative of it. The change is embedding and setting in. You know, we didn't bounce back to the way we were quickly, so now it's a, progress, a progressive change. So what what we need is our adaptation strategies, not a chance of trying to go back. And, and those adaptation strategies have to think about the impact. So this is a return to work barometer, and these are largely American cities, and I have some data in a minute that shows where we are in terms of Canadian cities, but it really shows that we're somewhere about halfway back to where we once were in almost every major city in North America. And this has real effects, and, I, and, and it's, it, yes, we've come to a great deal of convenience, but there is a very substantial underlying economic change is happening. So in terms of the small retail businesses that were in the downtown that many of us as employees supported when we worked downtown, they are finding that foot traffic three days a week is not enough to keep the business open. And they are closing in large numbers, and we're seeing it increasingly around the continent. 
see restaurants close, shoe repairs, dry cleaners, uh, people who provide professional services, even dentists' offices are moving out of the core and reestablishing in other areas of the city. Uh, in Toronto right now, they, uh, Avison and Young has estimated that foot traffic uh, in the PATH system, which connects all the major buildings, is about 40% of what it was pre-pandemic. And 40% of the foot traffic will change everything in the way that entire system will actually work. So this is uh, not a new trend, though. This is not something that just was precipitated by the pandemic. If you actually look at the longer term trend, and this is over a 20 year look, there have been declines in the, in the amount of new office creation all around North America. And more and more companies were already moving to hybrid work ever since the technology made that possible. What the pandemic did is it took a long-term trend line and put it on steroids and made it actually happen a lot faster. So we're seeing the, the consequences of a long-term trend. But when we talk ag again about the, the, the other side of the equation, the significant part, and I apologize to every commercial landlord in the room, because I'm not giving you a happy story, is that the actual value of office buildings are declining across North America. And what the knock-on effect of that is, uh, and I don't want to worry the city councillors in the room, is that the, the commercial property taxation from the commercial office class will drop and continue to drop over the next five years, maybe to ten. And to give, put, put real numbers on this, Washington, D.C., the other capital in North America, uh, is lost $464 million in revenue as a city because of declining assessed values in commercial real estate. Luckily for Ontario cities that we have a very slow process of reevaluating the valuation of property, so it will take time for us to see this. San Francisco, which had a very, very large office component as their economy, it's actually one of the hardest hit cities in all of North America, has lost $728 million in revenue from lower taxation, from lower assessed values. Now, this slide shows a rel you know, the, the problem is that downtowns had become too office dependent. Uh, the cities that will struggle the hardest are the ones that don't have a mixed economy in their downtown or a mixed use of their downtown. The healthiest downtowns are the ones that have a large residential population so that things are balanced out a little bit. And the reason why a large residential population is important for all those knock-on is you need about a thousand people within a five minute walk of any business in order to support it. So you need those density levels to be there in order to do it. So permanent downtown residential population gives you that economy and that vibrancy and it allows shocks in the system to be absorbed a little bit more easily. This slide was brand new, it's just come out. It's data that goes back to November, but what it shows is the, uh, is the downtown vibrancy index that's been put together by uh, University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Toronto. And this is based on cell phone activity in the downtown, and it's about people whose cell phones ping a tower in the downtown core. And as you can see, across North America, it varies quite substantially. So Ottawa is in the class, and we're in the mid-sized cities. We're about two-thirds of the way down the list on the right-hand side. And the left-hand side is the largest cities in, in, the world, in the, uh, North America. And we're all roughly in the same space. If you look at Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City, Toronto, we're all in about 50-something percent range as well. So we certainly are not in the ones that have bounced back the fastest, but we're also not at the bottom of the list. But it does show you that the point the mayor made is that we're all, all cities around North America are suffering from the same challenges and looking for the same sets of solutions. So I'm going to wrap up really quickly because I, there are others to talk. So really what we need to focus in on is over the next two decades, a large majority of new households who live in cities will tend to be singles or couples who prefer strong, uh, mixed-use walkable places. This is where the demographic, that's what they want to live in. So if we can f look at that as an opportunity and pair that up with the downtown problem, there really are a number of potential solutions. And the two cities in Canada that have done the most so far, and, and I know Mary's going to talk a little bit more of this as well, to look at this because they've been looking at it longer than we have because they started before the pandemic looking at the health of their downtowns, is first of all Montreal, sorry, the um, clicker's not working. Are you able to advance the slide for me, please? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the city of Montreal, I mean, Montreal's been facing a difficult downtown condition all the way back to the 1970s when the separatism scared caused a lot of people to leave Montreal. And they, they as a downtown, have been working on strategies and they have focused very heavily in the last decade of having more downtown living. So if you go to downtown Montreal, there are crane, uh, tower cranes in the air for the last number of years and they are all residential development that's being built and they've gone in impressively in terms of focusing on residential development and programming for the arts and culture in the downtown core and Montreal's strategy therefore is ahead of every other city in Canada in my opinion in terms of looking at the future and they are very well positioned for this and then Calgary uh, Mary's worked directly with Calgary with some of my colleagues out in our, our Western offices looking at that and Calgary had the oil shock that caused them to look at, a, at how to repurpose their downtown after all the, the major head offices of oil companies downsized considerably, and this was pre-pandemic. So these cities have been at it longer than the rest of us, and I think there are some clues to our future in terms of the work they've already done. So thanks for that. I'm going to uh, turn it over. Thank you, Stephen. Mary, what is it that you do at the Canadian Urban Institute? Go where I'm invited. <laughs> Thanks Thank for having me back. Yeah, thank you for coming back. Delighted. Uh, we're in the connective tissue business at CUI. I'm really happy to see all of you again. Um, I want to just challenge you. If you're 60 or over, stand up. Come on, I'm not the only 60 or over person here. <laughs> if you're 60 or over, now, we're going to play a little game here. I'm going to give you a song lyric and you're gonna give me the last line, all right? You listening, 60 or over, not very many of us, 60 or over. Here, I'm gonna start. When you're alone, and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown. <laughs> Petula Clark, Petula Clark, anyone? Uh, I have some slides too, but I, I just wanna breeze right through them and just say a couple of things about this. The reason I used that Petula Clark thing, my father loved that song. It was in the 60s, we, lived, we were at a cottage. We went to try to buy him an LP, the record of downtown. But let's, here's what's interesting about the 1960s in downtown. You didn't go downtown to work. You went downtown because it was a place. It was a place where things were happening. It was a place where you saw things and met people and experienced things that you could experience nowhere else. It was a unique place. Somewhere in the 80s, we decided that, maybe it was the 70s, we decided that downtowns would become monocultures where you just had office space, and that's what you did. You went to, you know, you went to work for the man downtown. And we've got to now claim that back to being a really exciting place. And that's what you guys have in spades. You have a downtown that is a place. You have all sorts of amenities and things. Lots of places don't. Been to Phoenix? Trust me, it's not a place. There's no, as Gloria, uh, you know, there's no there there. And uh, I think the key point here, I'll just breeze through these maybe, is, you know, we're, we're trying to make this conversation at CUI about the future of cities generally. So downtowns are part of a larger strategy, but they're part of a piece. It's not only one solution, it's a whole bunch of solutions which includes addressing all these things. But downtowns are kind of the canary in the coal mine, petri dish, Everything that's good about a city is downtown. Everything that's bad about a city is downtown. So we got to start there. And you already know why downtowns matter. You actually statistically matter economically. We always have to put that argument in because people don't listen if it's not about economics. But it's got to be about a whole bunch of other things. These are all stats that you already know. Sadly, you lead on a bunch of crummy indicators. Uh, don't let that discourage you, though, because, you know, and this is the other thing. We talked about this at dinner last night. There's a ton of popular media that's not favorable towards you. Sadly, that was true before the pandemic, so you just kind of wear it. It's just part of the, you know, it's like everybody hates Toronto. Uh, uh, so some, you're, you're going to have a hard time turning that message around. Part of what we did is, is commission this, uh, we were commissioned by the CMHC to do this report on looking at adaptive reuse, exactly what Steve and I think Stefan are getting at, that buildings in downtowns have to be repurposed all the time. And my colleague, Jennifer Baird, who's here in the front, uh, led this study and knows everything about every building in, this, in the country that could be repurposed. If you want to know about it, she knows. Um, it's not the total answer, but it's a principle about how we understand 
continuing to allow cities to evolve and buildings in cities to evolve for different purposes. If you look in European cities, you will see that a building may have been a this, and then it was a that, and then it went back to being a this. This is, we're young. We're a young country. Our cities are young relatively. So when you think about why these things matter, if you need a slide to tell your neighbors why your work matters, you can borrow this slide from us and use it. It's kind of a no-brainer. All these things are important, and the fate of the country hangs on how our cities do. That's all there is to it. The way that our democracy is organized, it's sometimes hard to know that, but that is true, that if we don't invest in our cities, if we don't find new strategies for our cities, the Canadian economy and the Canadian social fabric is not going to hold. So it's important for us to try to convey that to people in a way to understand why it matters what we're doing. I put this up because Mayor Daley, the first Mayor Daley, the father, uh, was, uh, was criticized. Why was he spending so much time and energy on downtowns? And he replied and said, because an apple rots from the core. So that's why we need to spend special attention to this. And then I've borrowed these quotes that Jen put in her report around Yogi Berra that nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. <laughs> or, and that you can't rely on downtowns to have people there, you've got to put them there. The other critical part of the core, we at CUI have two lenses to look at cities. One is downtowns in the core, and the other is the spine of the city, your main streets. And so you've got to forge alliances with the business improvement area folks, all the people that are engaged in community life at the ground level, at the street level. That's so critical that you stitch together that relationship. Because when we started, during the pandemic, we started something called Bring Back Main Street, and people said, oh, you're giving up on downtowns, are you? And I said, no, no, no. This is the, you know, two sides of the same coin. It's all about the quality of places and places being different. And in fact, downtowns have main streets as part of their anatomy. And what you want to do is invest in, in different kinds of ways depending on the particular assets of that main street or that neighborhood. So part of what Steve is getting at is you want a downtown to become more of a complete neighborhood and to become its own distinct neighborhood. And you have so many assets to work with. As I said, go to Phoenix. Uh, that it's a question now of how you can stitch together a narrative and work collaboratively on that, so. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> That's why we keep inviting you back to Ottawa, because you're so passionate about it and you sing songs. We really appreciate that. Um, Stefan, I might go back to you to ask the next question. Uh, in your experience, what other cities have you seen, Canada or otherwise, um, what are your observations about what they're facing pre-pandemic and, and today? Thank you. I'm going to speak a little bit on the government perspective. Last week, I'm also the president of a, the Workplace Network, which is a worldwide organization of government that own real estate. So 14 to 15 uh, country work together in, uh, day in and day out to see what others are doing and learning from their experience. Last week I was in Washington and we seen the same thing as we see in Ottawa. It was the same in the state before the pandemic. 60% of government office were utilized day in and day out. In Europe, they had 0.7 uh, offices per employee. They already had moved to a smaller footprint and already pre-pandemic, so the, not everybody had their office, so they already had moved. So more population, different population, eating in restaurants throughout the week. Uh, now they're aiming, after the pandemic, they're aiming to 0.5 office per employee. Again, shrinking their footprint, talking government, national government here. In the States, we see the same thing. Building, government buildings are empty. Uh, Washington is basically there's a lot of tourism, so that's something we could work. Ottawa is the same thing. So how can we take some of these buildings, convert them into housing, really bringing life, and that's what Mary was talking about, bringing life into the downtown. I think that's the only thing we could do, and Canada Land is definitely willing to work with the federal government to take some of those buildings and bring them into to the market to make really a uh, vibrant place where people want to live and not only come to work, basically. They want to live there. Thank you very much. S Steve, you touched on a couple of other cities. Do you have other examples of what you've seen in downtowns and in your work? So 
I had a chance last week to talk to some of my colleagues in different parts of North America about what, you know, what they're seeing on the ground. And what I think were the, the cities who are focusing a lot on creating downtown arts and cultural opportunities and downtown populations and small business support for adaptation focused on the smallest businesses are the ones who, again, are, are leading the foot race on recovery right now. Um, lots of communities are sitting, trying to say, we're still in this waiting game to see if it's going to bounce back more. So we're at 50% now. Are we going to get to 70? Where are we going to? Um, the cities that are you know, the, the Pittsburghs, the Montreals and Calgarys, the, the uh, kind of the Boston suburbs who are saying, okay, we're moving on already. It's like, we're not, we're not gonna track that number anymore. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not gonna worry about that number anymore. It doesn't matter what our percentage is. This is our plan to move forward are the ones that are, are, are get, having success right now. And I think the worst thing is to be indecisive and wait expecting to replicate what was there, you know, 2018. It's, that's not going to happen. So I think that's the important point that we have to kind of get ourselves around. And, and I think, um, you know, the work that Stefan's team does and the work that others about an orderly withdrawal from the office space presence of a largest employer in the region is actually going to be really helpful to all of us because it will allow that transition to happen. But it also has to happen in the private sector as well. Thank you. Mary, what are you seeing in other cities? You know, I think the, um, here's the dilemma you've got as a public sector dominated city is that you have an expectation that things will be done in orderly, kind of predictable, I see people nodding their heads, a PowerPointy kind of way. But you know, the really great cities in our culture are ones that are haphazard and mixed up and kind of complicated and not predictable. And so you need to embrace the chaos side of this and, not, and try to temper your expectation that it's going to be predictable and planned out and just be really opportunistic. And I agree with Steve that the granular approach to that is how do we, and it'll be interesting to see if Candlelands can do it under your leadership, it's up to you, um, to get this into smaller pieces. Get this into smaller pieces because the, the days of big mega projects, with all due respect to the developers around the table who are dying to do a mega project, knock yourselves out, you've got lots of chances. But in fact, and I was talking to somebody coming in, a landscape architect, who was, we were talking about the value of smaller interventions. So do not underestimate the opportunity to just build this back block by block by block. And remember that, that is, that's why people come, that's why Petula was right. You come into an environment because you're curious, because you're going to see your experience or purchase or interact in a way that you haven't before. And so do not underestimate that. And I would really be cautious about that it's a bit of a Canadian thing, and it's certainly a thing in, publicly, in, in cities that are dominated by public service, is that you wait for some big, grand gesture, big, grand plan. It ain't the solution. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I'll just stick with you. So from your unique perspective, what opportunities do you see specifically for revitalizing downtowns and anything that you see specific to Ottawa? And just based on what you shared just now, you know, this concept of a whole of community approach, mm -hmm. um, what do you see as, as the big opportunities? Well, again, you know, when we look at Calgary, and is there anybody here from Calgary? You're everywhere. Nobody from Calgary here. No, nobody here has ever lived in Calgary. You lived in Calgary. So, you know, the tendency now is, hello, Calgary. The tendency now is to say, oh, well, Calgary's got the answer. Well, Calgary has had nine years of it, and they've had to try to figure out what would a made in Calgary answer look like. And they had a similar vulnerability to yours in that they were overly dependent on one economic sector and when that you know the the lack of diversity in their economy was as much a challenge for them as yours is here so the question for you is going to be how do you now take advantage of this you know we can use all sorts of worn adages making lemons out of lemonade but in fact it's you already had all sorts of uh, entrepreneurial activity that was operating under the radar uh, as i suggested with that slide showing all the popular media you've got an uphill battle here to change a narrative uh, around Ottawa, which is probably not reflective of what's really true, what each of you is doing in your local neighborhood, in your local community. So what I would suggest is that the city, I'm looking at you, Cindy, and your colleagues, the city needs to find ways to make it easier to do unusual things. 
You need to get kind of out of the way and find a way to create more enabling and more permission. I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, and used to go to Washington, D.C. for a bit of fun. And I can tell you, Washington, D.C. was not always fun. It really wasn't. But it is now, and it is largely because of the neighborhood interventions and the weird little developer projects that popped up in certain neighborhoods that nobody thought anybody would invest in. In fact, I was thinking, sitting listening to the mayor, thinking, you guys should create some kind of an exchange with your, your peers in, Ottawa, in uh, Washington and have a conversation and go and look at the neighborhoods in Washington and look at the downtown and how that has transformed over the last 15 or 20 years. So my encouragement of you is that you build a really diverse, broad coalition of interest that are going to wrap their arms around Ottawa and make Ottawa what you believe it to be. And don't wait. And, and try to see if you can get yourself out of this kind of victim position where, oh, the federal government did this, or, oh, the pandemic did that, or Big Bad Canada Lands is doing this, and get to a place where you've locked arms with them so that you're together going to create a really interesting capital for the country. I think everybody's watching, and I think you've had moments in your history where you've emerged in this way, and I think you can emerge again. But you've got you've to lead that kind of diverse charge. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Stefan, do you want to go next? What opportunities do you see in, in cities for downtowns, but I anything in Ottawa? In Ottawa, definitely. We have a lot of work in Ottawa as Canada Lands Company, but, you know, I, could I be honest? Ottawa is an office city. It's a nine to five city. Most of the time, nine to five, except on summer when there's visitor and tourism. So people come to work, makes me think of Regina also, is a little bit of a nine to five city. People come to work, they go home. Uh, we have an opportunity of a lifetime to change that to Mary's point, building small community, attracting people, but we also have a lot of uh, building stock downtown that could help us to bring people living downtown, being there seven days a week because that's where they live. Uh, Toronto was an example of thinking Microsoft moved from Mississauga, they shrink their footprint, but they moved to the CIBC building straight downtown. Why? because they want to attract talent. And where does the talent live in Toronto? They live downtown. They're the young kid on the street. If you walk the street at night, it's full of people. They're young, they're out of university, they live in a three, uh, you know, a small one bedroom or in a, fl in a flat, and they work downtown. They can't work from home because the apartment's too small, so they have to go to work. Think about Europe, it's a little bit of the same thing, right? They have smaller footprint. They don't live in 4,000 square foot home in the middle of the suburb of Ottawa. They live in 500 square feet apartments, so they don't want to stay there the whole day. They want to go out and they're going to go to work. So can we build apartment downtown here where young people coming out of Ottawa U will decide to stay? and start living here so we make a vibrant community. And that's what Calada Land wants to do with this redevelopment project, is really work with the federal government to make sure that we, we get there in this Ottawa, uh, that we get there with a vibrant downtown. Uh, and I'll close on that. The, I also manage the CN Tower in Toronto. So an attraction, 1.5, 1.7 million visitors a year. You know, we have parliament here that people come and, and see and visit. We can take advantage of that also and, and drive, thrive, make sure the city thrive behind that. And fully agree, Mary, on reducing the, the red tape and taking some risk because otherwise it's not gonna, we're not gonna move if we wait for the federal government to uh, bring back their employee five days a week. Even if they tried, we see in across North America, it's not working. Hybrid is there to, is here to stay, and it's going to continue. As Stephen says, the trend was started before the pandemic, and it's just accelerated in the pandemic. Thank you, Stefan. Stephen, what opportunities do you see in other cities, and, and specifically Ottawa? Well, I, th I think the reality is that, and, and I, I'm an eternal optimist about cities. Cities reinvent themselves. That's what they've done for thousands of years before governments really paid attention, before planning existed, economic development existed. Cities reinvent themselves depending on cycles and the like. And, and I, 
I remember quite vividly that early in my career, I lived in downtown, downtown Toronto, and I would, worked for the government of Ontario at one point and managed to get out of what three weeks before the pink slip came when Mike Harris came in and cut the provincial civil service by a third. And the provincial government unloaded an enormous amount of office space onto the market. And that office space, because of the recession of the early 90s, took a while to happen. But 10 years later, all of that office space that was redundant was absorbed back. You know, some of those buildings were converted, some of them were knocked down and replaced with new buildings. The parking lots that were there in the 1990s are gone now. You can't find parking anywhere, by the way, in downtown. And if you if you do, you pay and take out a mortgage to park your car. Um, so all that the city the city adapted. It did it. It was went through a shock and it bounced back. Now, what's the bounce back plan? How do we do it? How do we enable it? Mary's quite right. We have to let it get a little messier. We have to be really creative. We have to be open-minded. We can't be looking in the rear view mirror and set the rules based on what used to happen. We have to look and be open-minded on a future basis of being, okay, maybe something different will happen here. So I think to, to remain optimistic, because I still believe Ottawa has all of the natural assets, um, that make it a beautiful city to live in. The quality of life here is really, really high compared to other cities. Um, I think we can get there, but we just have to, as I said, be open to the fact that it's not a reset to before, it's a look forward. I agree. Thank you very, very much. So um, I'm just going to open it up now to the floor and see if anybody who's here has a question for any of our panelists this morning. Yes, there's a mic coming to you. If you can stand up and introduce yourself and who your question is for, that would be great. smaller apartments might work for them, but what happens to them when they become families? And I feel like, and this has been you know, a pet peeve of mine, we are not building our cities for family life. So if we then drive the young couple who now has one kid out to the suburbs, that kid's growing up in a suburb, he's not a downtown kid anymore and we go through another cycle. So I, I'm a bit concerned about that statement uh, and maybe you can answer. And the second question I had was for uh, Stéphane is, why does it take Canada Lands so long to bring a project to fruition when we're dying to build houses and now we're pushing the urban boundaries out where you have prime, prime urban real estate to develop? So I'll try to tackle the, sorry, I'll try to tackle the first question. First and foremost, every North American city has struggles with the idea of accommodating families in the downtown. Uh, it, it is a function of the costs per square foot of real estate, and it, it is 100% related to people's capacity to pay for that. Um, lots of people make choices. I, I, I remember I made the choice just before we had children that we moved from downtown Toronto out to a suburban area, and that was not the choice I wanted to make. It was driven by my capacity and what my affordability was. And I'm representative of, I'd say probably 90% of the population who make end up making the same decision. So it, it, but it's not just Ottawa. This is not a unique Toronto, Vancouver suffer from it in a much more extreme way. Now there are things that governments do that exacerbate that problem and one of it is is let the schools deteriorate let the playgrounds deteriorate you know the minute the schools don't offer that I, I remember looking for a place to live in Ottawa and because of two of my kids have special needs I couldn't get downtown schools or even inner city schools that service my kids needs I had no choice but to go to suburbs so the government decisions do play into this um, I'm a, I'm a big believer that school decisions make a huge part of that part, point. But, but cities, what they have to do is, is enable multiple family dwelling types in the downtown core. And I know with the new official plan in the city of Ottawa and what the provincial government has done recently is more multifamily housing types are now permitted as of right in the world. And that will give more chances for more affordable products to be built if the development community follows 
follows that lead and actually provides the product to people. So it is, it's a very, very difficult question and Mary probably has more to add to this than I do. I'm just gonna jump in, even, I, I, even though you didn't ask me, I'll just, my two cents on this. Um, if you map across the country a block off main streets, you will find people who are overhoused. Many, I mean, we have historically had family housing a block off a main street forever. You walk any main streets, you'll see it. And there's a widow there or an older couple there with three empty bedrooms. That's why Airbnb happened, right? And so we've gotta to try to find a way to, you're going to agree with me or disagree? It's not, uh, well, both. Okay, because, because I think we have the stock. We, we want to do a piece of work now on how do you reintroduce housing onto main streets because family multi-unit housing is critical and we've got to just figure out how to get the math and the pro forma to work so that the development community will actually care about this and actually intensify those because there's a lot of built form that we could be using differently. No? Uh, I agree that there are a lot of elderly people who are what you would call as overhoused. However, they are also the corporate memories of our neighborhoods and communities. They are also the grandparents to the children who don't have those people around. And right. the, the boxes being built are so no, I'm agreeing with you. tiny, like, yeah. they have zero appeal to those people who don't want to part with their dining room sets. So and we've got to find a way to create multi-gen housing so they can actually stay in that dwelling and then their kids or their grandparents or other people move in, right? Agreed. We've just got to get imaginative about this. Yes, yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm sure the city's listening. <laughs> you could do something really interesting. You could, you could lift some rules. It would be very interesting and you would be leading the way. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Uh, definitely, we want to accelerate. There's a lot of consultation that goes into a major development like the 310 acre that is Water Ridge the old rock, rock cliff base. So a lot of consultation with community to ensure acceptability. There's consultation also with uh, indigenous community. So in this case, we have a partnership with AOO. So all of this take time, permits, uh, master plan with the city. There's definitely a way to accelerate, but there's also the absorption possible uh, the absorption by the developer and the availability like we have a lot of uh, a lot of labor shortage in any construction market either uh, on high rise and low rise so that's all issue that makes us slowing down the development of these uh, of, of these uh, large parcel of land, but we're looking to accelerate. That's one of the objective of the federal government, accelerate disposal of surplus asset and bring them back to market as soon as possible. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you for the question. We have another one over here. Steve Georgopoulos, so I commend the Ottawa Business Journal for doing what uh, you do this year and other years. I'm gonna pass the mic to my good friend Daniel here, and then I'll ask my question. And Daniel's from Youth Ottawa. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniel Bersenu, and I'm one of the representatives from Youth Ottawa. And my question is for Mary, but also for all of the panel. Um, how can we engage youth in downtown development apart from, I guess, new developments and new buildings? And what role do you see youth play in shaping a city's vision? Can you just come home with me and you and I are going to become best friends and we'll start to talk about this? I need more people like you. Uh, you know, um, I think the, it, it sort of ties into Steve's question about schools. Uh, if we could find ways, and there are organizations like Evergreen across the country that work on school yards and work on creating different kinds of spaces around schools, but part of what we're trying to do is encourage young people to engage in the quality of their community and realize they can make a difference to it as soon as they hit school. So. Uh, I think part of it is, we, you know, one of the concerns we have along Main Streets, for instance, is that we used to historically have institutions that would you know, find a way to engage everybody. So churches, faith institutions, uh, community centers, uh, libraries, schools, all these ways in which you had an opportunity to actually engage in community life. And I worry for the, my generation of parents that we somehow lost our track of that and we've raised kids that don't actually have access to those kinds of services. So part of what we need to do is encourage the institutional life that exists in our neighborhoods to be connecting with schools and connecting with youth groups and connecting with community programs so that you have lots of ways to contribute. 
and so that you will then start contributing as a young teen and then through university and then you'll it'll just be part of who you are and you will grow into that role uh, and and I think that the other thing, and you'll hear Mike Moffat, who was, uh, Mike and I were both in Peterborough on Thursday, so I had a sneak peek at what he's going to talk to you about. And he is going to talk to you about investing in uh, amenities for young, young kids and for young families. And what would be good is for you to challenge him and say, well, it's not just about housing. It's actually about how are we creating a culture of engagement that includes everyone. So it's so great you're here. Thank so. you for saying that. There the concept, that's the whole concept of an abundant community, that everybody in the community has something to offer. And then as leaders, our role is to find a way to to uh, leverage that. Uh, Steve, or sorry, Stefan or Stephen, did you want to speak to the youth element of the question? Just wanted to add, you know, on all of our development in the city of Ottawa and across the country from Newfoundland to uh, British Columbia, we have open door, we have consultation with the community. Please get involved. You can ape, help us shape those future community so that they, they meet the, the needs of the youth uh, that are in the community. So please get involved as soon as, uh, and I, I'm willing to connect with you and ensure that you're involved every time there's a public consultation on the future of our communities that we're building around this city. <laughs> <laughs> Could I give Sean an answer? Yeah. Uh, open to look at other ways of doing things. Obviously, uh, Canada Land's company is a self-financing company, so we have to be viable. Uh, the government doesn't give us property. They sell us property at market value, and we have to redevelop them. Uh, now, in a lot of our project, we have 20% uh, affordable housing instead of 10. So we're increasing uh, the, uh, our objective to meet government uh, objective. We're also working, and I don't know if there's somebody from CMHC here, but we're also working with CMHC and their federal land initiative which is also a really good opportunity to take some older stock building and converting them into social housing and all that. And discussion with them, they already have a few building in town that they're sites, I should say, that they're looking at to, to bring. And again, they're going to work with uh, the private sector and developer to, to achieve that. Thank you, Stefan. So that's all the time that we have. Um, thank you very much. To Can we have a big round of applause for all of our <laughs> expert, our expert panelists? And I just I want to thank you, Stephen, for the work that you're doing and, and volunteering with the Board of Trade. Stefan, welcome to your new role. And we look forward to an ongoing relationship with you. And Mary, it's always a pleasure to have you. This is just the beginning of our conversation, hopefully, in our work together uh, for the downtown in Ottawa and our whole region. So um, we really appreciate you being here and the work that you're doing.